Uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Mark Siegler, and on behalf of the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics, I welcome you to today's lecture in the series on ethical issues in healthcare reform. Uh, today's talk, as many of you know, is the fifth in a series of 28 uh, Wednesday noontime lectures uh, on the topic of health reform. Uh, last week, you remember, uh, Dean Polanski talked to us about how health reform will affect the mission of University of Chicago Medicine. And next week, uh, Jim Madera, the CEO of the AMA, will speak on the American Medical Association and the reform of healthcare. Today, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our speaker, uh, Helen Darling. Uh, Helen Darling is president and CEO of the National Business Group on Health, which next year will celebrate its 40th anniversary. Uh, the National Business Group on Health is a nonprofit organization representing large employers' perspectives on national health policy issues. In 2013, its 377 employee members, employer members, included 66 of the Fortune 100. And that group purchased health and disability benefits for more than 50 million employees, retirees, and dependents. Helen Darling serves on the Medical Advisory Panel and Technology Evaluation Center of the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association on the Institute of Medicine's Roundtable on Value and Science-Driven Healthcare, on Medicare Coverage Advisory Committee, and is on the board of the National Quality Forum. Uh, Ms. Darling has been featured on many TV stations, CNN, ABC, NPR, uh, discussing trends in healthcare costs and benefits, and her observations are often quoted in the major newspapers like the Times and the Journal, The Economist, The Washington Post. In 2009, Helen Darling was given the World at Work's Highest Honor, the Keystone Award, recognizing her contributions to health resources and benefits. In 2012, she was given the National Committee for Quality Assurances Health Quality Leader Award. In 2011, 2012, and 2013, Ms. Darling was named one of the 100 most influential people in healthcare in the United States. Today, Helen Darling will speak to us on how large employers are responding to the ACA, the Affordable Care Act. Helen Darling. This legislation is the single most important thing that's happened to our country since 1965 in terms of health care. And our view as an organization, as I say, we don't lobby, but we have certainly a set of principles. And um, they include the expectation and the hope that every resident of the United States will have access to affordable health coverage. And so we work to make certain that anything that's happening that will contribute to that, to try to make it more effective, uh, is what, what we should be doing. So that's what we do. Okay, I'll try, all right. So um, first I'd like to give a little bit of context to what employers, and I'm speaking mostly for large employers, but frankly, the concerns of employers are very similar. They may be different what they can do about it if they're large or medium or small, but the concerns are not that different. So I think the most important context uh, fact is that most employers feel that the cost of health benefits for their employees of, and family members have become increasingly unaffordable. Just to give you some numbers and give you a sense of what we're talking about, the cost of a family of four in a PPO in the United States today on average is over $22,000. And if you know that total household income in the United States overall is slightly under 50,000, we're talking about an increasingly large proportion of all money and benefits that are given to employees are going to health care. And that's part of what is a source of concern. You can see that the cost per employee, so this, this adds together dependents, 
um, and employees together, the total amount, and then divide it by the number of employees, so it's a per employee number, is over $13,000 in 2013. So if you hire 50 new people and you multiply that times $13,000, you're talking about what it costs if you want to hire 50 new people. And as you'll hear some more, that's one of the reasons that most people who are following this are very concerned about the impact on jobs. And that's generally true. I'll say this throughout. Most of the stuff that's being talked about and charged, if you will, with the Affordable Care Act has nothing to do with the Affordable Care Act. It's been going on for years. There there have been all sorts of problems. The Affordable Care Act is trying to fix them, and I'll, I won't say uh, exclusively good things about it, because a lot of things didn't happen that should have happened. But the aim of the Affordable Care Act was to, to solve some of these severe problems that we have no matter what, even if we didn't have the Affordable Care Act. Now, one of our concerns is, if you just look at this figure, between 1997 and 2007, health care consumed almost 36% of the real increase in per capita income. And I've actually seen some figures, and if anybody's really interested, I could find them for you, that show that at the rate we're going, including in this instance the cost related to the Affordable Care Act, that anyone who's in a household that is at the median or below in this country would be spending 150 to 300% of their income on health care because the income isn't growing anything like health care. And that's, that's part of what everybody's alarmed about. Now, no matter what, employers care a lot about the health, safety, and productivity of their employees and their family members. Why wouldn't they? They give them a paycheck to come to work. They give them a paycheck to be productive. They don't do it just because they want to be nice people. They like to be nice people, too, most of them, I think. Maybe not all of them. But they, they do care about the health and productivity of their workforce. So they have a good reason, a completely selfish, if you will, business reason for investing in health care. Now, this just gives you a picture of what's been happening overall. And you can see that in 2014, it's estimated uh, most our large employer members are budgeting 7% for the increased medical claims costs. And I do want to mention, our members do not deal with insurance companies except as administrative uh, forces. They, pay, you know, they, they write checks out of the corporation or the employer's bank account directly to providers. All they do is pass money back and forth. They may, the employers may buy services from them. They may say, oh, well, you know, we'd like care management. And then they can decide to buy it from the insurance company, the big health plan, or they can buy it from a specialty vendor. And that's the kind of stuff they do all the time. So we're not talking about insurance companies, and we're not talking about premiums here. And that's another important point that gets horribly mixed up in the discussions that I have going on. Kathleen Sebelius, you all may know, is being grilled today by the House Subcommittee. Uh, it, is, it is the worst example of our political process imaginable. It's painful when you know the subject to watch this stuff because the, the, the misinformation behind the question and the ability to answer it without sounding like you're being preachy. And I've been on the other side of these a few times, and it's very hard to not just want to stop and say, excuse me, would you like to know that we're not talking about insurance companies? We're talking about the cost of medical care, and we're talking about this. But if you do that, and I watched her a little bit this morning, when she tried to do that as diplomatically as possible, it's hard. You just have to kind of shut down and take it and just hope you get out of there alive. <laughs> so anyway, so, that's, so this is what we're looking at. Now, as I mentioned, one of the biggest concerns, especially that I think everybody has right now, at least in terms of families and households, is we are now, just now in 2013, beginning to be where we were as a country before the financial meltdown and the Great Recession. We're really sort of a back to 2000. So if you've got kids who are older or you're one of the younger, younger adults yourself, if you think you're better, you're worse off today than you were in 2000, you're right. Everybody's worse off except a handful of the 1%, and it's less than 1%, by the way. Almost everybody else is definitely worse off. 
So their household income and their ability to bear the cost of the cost sharing that they have to have has declined dramatically. And this, I'll talk more about that in, in the context of uh, increased cost. Now, here I want to say that the Affordable Care Act, whatever its other strengths and weaknesses, and it has plenty of both, I want to be clear, it will cost a lot of money. And this particular table's only purpose is to show you what the additional, these are just on top of everything else, fees, taxes, and costs that are going to be related to the Affordable Care Act and where they're going to fall. Now, there's no way we were going to cover originally 32 million more people, most of whom have no money, uh, without spending a lot of money. But this just gives you a picture of where it comes from. It can't come from the traditional sources because the traditional sources are already bankrupt. We're way in national debt. So this is sort of on top of all of that. And I'll talk a little bit about the Cadillac tax. Uh, I assume everyone in the room knows what the Cadillac tax is. Is that okay? Good. So somebody's saying no, so you don't mind my saying it. All right. So one of the big reason, one of the big ways to fund the Affordable Care Act is to say to pl health plans and employers, anybody who's buying insurance, that if you have a health plan that is very rich, and that's why it's called the Cadillac tax, then you're going to pay when you hit a certain number. And for individuals, it's $10,200. So if your health plan in 2018, it doesn't come till 2018, but we're not far from that now, then every dollar after $10,200 for an individual and every dollar off a fam from a family plan that costs more than $27,500, you're going to pay, or your employer, or your health plan, or somebody is going to pay a 40% tax. It's an excise tax on so-called Cadillac plans. Now, the original idea behind that is not a bad one. Economists have argued for years the fact that health benefits are tax protected, tax free, actually fuels inflation and fuels insensitivity by those who deal with it, whether the consumers or employers or insurance companies. As long as it's free and you're trying to decide what you're going to give to somebody, then that's, you know, you're not going to really care. And that's, there's no, they're wrong, I mean, they're right about the, the fact that it does fuel inflation. But right now what we're talking about is what many, many people in rich plans will ha have to pay this tax. Now, interestingly, here's the irony. The richest plans in America are local and state health plans for public employees, the richest plans in America. So the people who get hit first are the public employees. And I'm sure you've been following these stories about bankruptcies. If you look at places like Detroit, they, they probably already qualify for the Cadillac tax now because their plans are so rich. So, so those are some of the things that are driving those bankruptcies. But you can see some of the other ones, like the health industry surtax. It's believed that almost all the taxes that are being put on somebody who's selling something or providing a service will, in fact, be passed on in the prices, which is not surprising. I don't, what else could they do, right? But it just does mean that that means costs will go up because of these taxes and fees, if, if for no other reason. And then you can see, because you all will probably hear a lot about that here, is we have, at the same time, we have Medicare spending cuts. So we're having a kind of, you think of it like a pincer movement. Uh, very much like a war, you know, you sort of come in at the beaches of, of northern France or the beaches of Italy and you sort of squeeze towards um, the middle. And that's really what's happening and will happen more of. And it will, it means that, that there will be more cost that then will have to be paid so there'll be less money for the things you want to pay for other things. And at the same time, the revenue for that's being cut. So there are going to be double hits in here, and that's another reason we're all very worried. Now I'm going to show you a, a number of, of surveys or data from surveys that we, we do with our members and other large employers, just to give you a picture of what they're thinking about, too. So this particular graph shows you that even after 2014, that most employers believe that providing subsidized health benefits to active employees is very important. 
and that they're going to keep doing that. There's a lot of talk about, well, would employers stop covering people? That's, I get that question a lot. And the answer is, not unless something changes pretty dramatically. It's still very important. But most employers, more than two-thirds of employers, provide no retiree medical benefits. But those who do are saying, in the next uh, subsidized health care for benefits for retirees, they're saying they're going to do less of that. If anybody's left out there paying for retirees, they're going to be less likely to do it after 2014. And that's another one, by the way, that gets blarded into a lot of the public sector when you see these, uh, these articles. Just keep in mind, an awful lot of that is promised benefits that are unlimited, unbelievably rich and unlimited. Uh, that you are paying for as taxpayers. You can also see in this last graph that, that improved workforce health and productivity will continue no matter what to employers to be very important. So whether they're the ones who are actually providing the benefits in the future, that may change, but it will never change that they care about the health and productivity of their workforce. So as you'll see, one of the ways they're doing that, we're seeing more and more employers putting in on-site medical centers providing those services that improve safety and health, uh, flu shots on site, uh, they're looking at all sorts of new ways to access health care. So we also ask employers what they thought about the public health exchanges. So these are now the state exchanges. I'm switching gears again. We're saying, do you think some populations might be better places? You, the employer, think these groups would be better places for these groups the, to the public exchanges. And you can see that 41% thought that for those who today would take COBRA benefit, which is very expensive, as you know, under COBRA, you're allowed to buy back. I always think that sort of, aren't you lucky, right? You get to buy back at 102% uh, the health plan you had if you lose your job or you lose coverage either through uh, death, disability, retirement, termination, divorce, a whole bunch of things. So for COBRA plan participants, it's very likely that the exchanges, the public exchanges, will provide a more attractive option. If they don't, there's probably something wrong with the exchanges. So the pre-65 retirees is another group. As you know, you don't qualify for Medicare until you're 65, but some people still retire in this country, though, by the way, fewer and fewer before 65. So the, there's this feeling that some people will go to the exchange, and if they have low income, they might even get a substantial federal subsidy. Part-time employees, spouses or dependents, seasonal temporary workers. Interestingly, only 12% of the people surveyed in this, the employers, believe that full-time employees, current full-time active employees, might be candidates for the uh, state exchanges. And mostly that's going to be in companies like retail, retail uh, which is usually low wage and relatively low education, a lot of turnover and that sort of thing, and also hospitality. So people who work in um, hotels, who are especially the low paid workers, might be much better off in a public health exchange. So we also ask our employer members, what do you think you need to be doing? What's most important? What are the three most, of, most effective ways to control health care costs? And you can see that the top group in total, which is about, I think, 58%, if I've got my numbers right, uh, think that having wellness programs and initiatives to improve employee health is most important. And then the second most important is consumer-directed health plans. These are plans mostly with higher deductibles and higher cost sharing. So th these are the plans that more and more people will be in. Uh, and you'll, I think you'll see a big increase. Most employers now, almost all employers now, provide at least one consumer-directed health plan as an option. And about 20% of large employers provide only a consumer-directed health plan. So you will see more movement as you, to extend if you're dealing with people, you will see more people who have higher deductibles and higher cost sharing. And those things should also drive down, put more pressure on health care costs, because people will not pay those costs if they have a choice. In fact, we know in Massachusetts at the connector, when people were choosing the plans, they, the vast majority of them chose 
either uh, the, the cheapest plan, I should say, because there are a lot of different versions. So when people are paying, if you will, with their own money or more of their own money, they choose less rich plans. So we also ask them, what do you think the marketplace is going to be like over the next five years? And you can see that it's very likely that we're going to see lots, lots more healthcare price transparency. There's going to be a, there are going to be a lot more mobile apps. So for example, we already have employers who provide through the health plan a mobile app that allows you to compare prices for certain, certain services. And also, they even have some that you can for, uh, for example, it has a GPS capability and it will tell you how to get to an urgent care center or a retail clinic or to a primary care physician's office. So they actually have all that information built in. And we also see uh, that new technologies will become more and more important. Alternate ways to get health care are going to become much more important. And they are going to compete with each other on price. So if somebody's sitting there trying to decide whether they're going to go this place or that place, they're going to be looking at what the per visit charge is, what's the cost sharing, and what, what would be paid for by their plan. We'll see also much more value-based design and things like that. So just in terms of what employers are worrying about right now and doing, they're first and foremost trying to stay up to date with the Affordable Care Act. The amount of administrative requirements are huge, even for large employers, even those who are not using the public health exchanges. Because their plans, they have to be sure to be in compliance with the law, and that means that there's a lot of work to be done. And I can go into more detail about that later if you're interested. We also see educating consumers to be more informed, and to, because they're going to be making a lot more decisions, that they're going to have to learn more. And it's going to be less and less possible for them to just say, oh, well, I don't need to know, because they actually are not going to have that choice anymore. And then also, most employers are saying, we want employees and their family members to understand that most of what drives their health care use, ha they have control over. And that they, they can do things that will make a huge difference in whether they need to even see a doctor, whether they need to go to an emergency room. And for the first time, it will really matter to them financially. You know, it's always mattered to them. You all know that because you probably see them all the time. But the difference is it hasn't mattered to them. They, you know, they wander into an emergency room because it's their convenience on a, they're on a, on a trip and instead of maybe calling a help advice line, they actually go to an emergency room. It would be 100% paid by somebody else, so they didn't need to worry. Then they ha started having little co-pays, and they're not very big, I might add, still not a big deal. But now they're going to be dealing with health plans and, and cost sharing that are very much different and they're gonna, they will change may not always be what you want, but they will change. So I have mentioned price and quality information. We're going to have more and more of that. We also are seeing another big trend that's important, and I'll mention this in relation to the Affordable Care Act. Employers have been, for the last five to 10 years, depending on who they are, how advanced they are, putting in programs to help employees and their family members live and choose healthier lifestyles. They're doing things like paying the money, $100 to do one thing, another 100 to do another, another 100 to sign up to a walking program, I mean, all sorts of things. But what we're seeing, for the ones that started before, they are now moving away from the positive rewards to essentially what look more like negative rewards or penalties. So for example, instead of giving you $100 to take a health assessment, they might say, will deduct $100 if you don't take a health assessment. A small number are saying, if you want to be in the best health plan, you have to do these things. And if you, in a, in a very, very few, very few, but I think more will do it, if you want a health plan at all, you're going to have to do these things. Now, in all instances, the, these are not achieving health outcomes. It's just saying you have to participate in these programs. The only one that well, even I was about to say tobacco. We're seeing a big increase in tobacco surcharges or non-smoker discounts. You know, these things are called different things depending on the audience and the workforce. Some people take more kindly to uh, carrots than sticks. But either way, you lose if you don't do certain things. 
So we're seeing a movement away from the friendlier, easier, just, just do this, to the if you don't do it, this is what's going to happen. And in some instances, it's going to be a lot of money. It may be $50 a month now for a tobacco surcharge. It's going to be $100 a month. There will be new requirements. And, and mostly, uh, we do have a handful of people who don't do whatever they're supposed to do. Uh, but they will pay more and more for not doing that. So I've just got several charts here. I won't go through them but because of time. But we have a long list of things that employers are doing. And if anybody's interested in those details, especially the different ways that they are controlling health care costs, and ideally also helping to support <coughs> payment and delivery reform, and even things like reform of the health care legal system, which we all believe is crucial uh, especially to trying to really do something significant about overuse, which is another one of the big problems. So this is a long list of those things that employers have to work with partners in order to accomplish. But if we don't do these things too, we're not going to solve all the problems in the healthcare system. So it's not just enough to charge more, get people to take a health assessment, or try to do everything you can to help them to live and choose healthier lifestyles. We also have to transform a system that's dysfunctional beyond belief and doesn't basically serve anybody's interest. So I'm going to switch now to a very specific look at what today, well, actually starting about two years ago, but right now, large employers are sitting down and trying to decide how they're going to deal with the Affordable Care Act in terms of their own employees, whether or not they're interested in public exchanges for their employees, and if so, for whom. And then if not, how about private exchanges? And I'll explain a little more about what they are. Or are they just going to stay the course? So this shows you in the three tracks. And I know this would be available to you all if you want to look at it in more detail. So a typical uh, head of human resources in a large corporation is sitting down and saying, do we just do what we've been doing for a long time? Do we move to private exchanges or do we move to public exchanges? And you can see there, out there, you can see the Cadillac tax uh, looming. So the Cadillac tax is actually causing everybody and was starting in about 2010 to begin doing more and more to try to control health care costs. Because at that time, everybody I know who's in this business said, we're not paying the Cadillac tax. And we've only got between now and 2018 to slow down cost growth enough to avoid it for at least three or four or five years out from 2018. Now, that's going to make a huge difference. It will also, again, make a huge gap between the public sector and the private sector. In this case, I mean mostly uh, state and local government. The federal government, interestingly, does not have an excessively rich program. They figured this out about 20 years ago. And, and they, they have a, a program that is much, much more like the private sector, interestingly. I might add, no one in Congress gives them credit for that. It is very frustrating. And in fact, I was once invited to, um, to come and testify. And you all probably know this, but any time you're invited to testify, the first thing they do is call you in and find out what you're going to say. Because they're not fools, right? Well, maybe they are, but they're not, they're not stupid. Um, but if, so if they don't like what you're going to say, I don't care how, how objective or fair-minded it is, you don't hear from them again, right? So I, I went there, I was asked about a year ago, somebody was trying to trash the administration. So I was called in and asked if I would come and, and talk about, sort of compare what the federal government does for its employees and the private sector. So I went in and um, I just said, well, actually, I think they're doing a really good job. And I said, I'm, they're actually very enlightened. And I, you know, I read chapter and verse and chapter and verse. And, and you could see the person's face just go from, hi, Helen, welcome, to, oh, really? Oh, yeah? Um, and I said, yes. And I said, I, you know, I, I can show you the data. Um, and they said, oh, OK. And you could just see the face just sink. And if I never got called, you can imagine. <laughs> and a lot of people did, who knew nothing about it. But they were willing to say all the negative things. So it's this kabuki theater of, of Washington. So, um, so I'll just do a little more on this just to give you a picture. So here are the kinds of things that employers are looking at. 
So um, most of them want to maintain ERISA and to be sure that they get protected uh, from state encroachment. That's the biggest problem. This is a federal law that allows them to give uniform uh, coverage. The tax advantages, they would vary. They would look at what their obligations are under the Affordable Care Act. So they weigh each of these different things, administrative burden, purchasing power for employees, et cetera. So you can see, and this again, if you, if you get a copy of this, you can see in more detail, but you can see that on staying the course, we're thinking about doing the things I've already talked about, just more of them. But an employer would mainly be responsible for making certain every detail of the plan is what they wanted for their employees, at least as long as they could. With the private exchanges, and these are brand new things, only about five or six years ago, four retirees were created. Uh, it's a private exchange. It's a marketplace in which human resource consulting firms or companies basically bring together multiple health plans, and then an individual would go into the private exchange, and just like the public exchange, could make multiple choices. So your employer could choose a private exchange, and the advantages you could see is, if, and they're now doing it for actives, just starting, just this year, brand new this year. But it would give them more choice, so right now you only get what your employer gives you, whereas in a private exchange you might have 5, 10, 15 choices. Um, you would have some, it, the employer would still give you the same money, but you'd be dealing with the exchange, not with the employer more. So there's less administrative burden. And then the third is, of course, the state exchanges, which, as you know, are operational, total mess at the federal government level. Um, and the amount of, of uh, I don't know, schadenfreude, uh, for those of you who know that word, um, that being, you know, the, the Republicans were really pretty devastated by what happened to them after the, um, they thought the sh shutting down the government would make everybody like them. And I'm not sure why, why but anyway, they, they thought that. So they got in trouble and they felt really um, like they had maybe gone a step too far. And of course now with the debacle on opening the website, they're sitting back hoping that that will take the attention off of them for a while and put it on the administration. But we will have state exchanges. And a number of the state exchanges, like California, are doing relatively well for something that big and that hard to do, especially if you're going to connect with Medicaid programs, because Medicaid programs have some of the worst operational systems imaginable. It's hard to deal with them, and it's very hard to connect with them. So that's probably one of the toughest challenges they've got. So employers are asking these questions. So I won't, I won't go into this in more detail, but this gives you the breakdown of all the things the employers have to consider and all the timeline that they have to consider it. And this is very active. This is going on almost every day in a company uh, around the U.S. So I won't go through the saying in the course because I think that's obvious. The private insurance exchange is what we'll see is starting in about 2014, 2015. If they're successful, we will see more employers using private exchanges. If they're not, they'll just either go back to staying the course or uh, some alternative. Maybe somebody will invent something new. So this is the state insurance uh, exchange timeline. So this is most employers do not have to pay a lot of attention to this because they're too big. As you know, the public exchanges are only for two groups, individuals or small employers. And they define small as really small. We call that tiny. Under 50, or the state can go to under 100 employees. So it will be years, possibly, before they could go over 100. So for large employers, the public health exchange may not be possible ever. So I will skip those. So I would just end with a comment about what employers are left with. Well, first, we have tremendous uncertainty about the future. There is more change. I've been in this field for over 30 years, and many of you perhaps have too. I've seen more change in the last five years than I saw in the prior 25. There's, there's mammoth tectonic changes going on every day in What's a provider? Where do you get care? Where's the best place to get care? What does it cost? 
What's it going to cost individuals? What do we, how can we not do some things? How can we change the way teams and primary care works? Are we going to sort of disaggregate everything so people will, instead of, will go actually the opposite of where we are going. We were headed, people were saying we want more integration. Well, at least on the private side, we're going to see more, more dispersion of everything. When people, uh, consumers can walk, if you will, and make choices, they're more likely to go where it's convenient for them including whatever they can access through a smartphone or whatever the new technology is that hasn't been developed yet. At least we haven't been told about it yet. The cost of health benefits continues to be top of mind for CFOs and frankly for most people at the top of the country. And we have done nothing to solve that problem. This is something I get asked by reporters all the time because the president and other people are saying costs have gone down. They have not gone down. That is just not true. And they frankly haven't gone down from any, for anybody. What they will go down for, though, is one group, and I think only one group, and that's the people who are going from the most dysfunctional individual insurance market on earth to the public exchanges. So for individuals, where they, are, they, they won't be selected against, they won't be underwriting, they won't be any of those things. Individuals that definitely be better off. But everybody else is going to pay more. And maybe that's the right thing to do, it, not making a judgment about it. It is going to cost more. Everybody else is going to pay more. Um, and you know, maybe it's good if they're spread around enough that nobody feels it too painfully through one pocket or another. But that's the fact. And right now we hear these, these comments. It's, it's maddening because the law does nothing to control cost by itself. And as a consequence, people are deluded when somebody says, well, you know, we're going to, costs have gone down. They haven't. Even when they say that, they mean the rate of increase has gone down. That's not the same thing as costs going down. Um, I've just mentioned all the other pressures that are going to be putting significant downward pressure on cost. So if you think some of the cuts and things like that are going on now are bad, it's going to get worse. So the need to actually make the kind of dramatic transformations that are needed through things like lean manufacturing and business process reengineering, all that's going to be done to try to reengineer cost and inefficiencies out of the system are going to be essential. Otherwise, a lot of things that need to be done will not be done, and we'll just all have a kind of miserable, inefficient world. Um, consumer cost sharing is going to increase significantly. And the political outlook, I think probably the most uh, heartbreaking thing from uh, where we sit is the Supreme Court's decision about Medicaid. Again, whatever you think about the Affordable Care Act or whatever you think about anything else, the belief was that there are millions of very poor, poor people in this country, very low income people, who for one reason or another did not have health coverage and didn't have access to it. And of course the original idea of the Affordable Care Act was that a big chunk of those people were going to be covered by an expansion of Medicaid. And now we have this peculiar, really shockingly um, sort of messed up situation where in, just take the state of Texas as an example. State of Texas has, they fight with California where they were number one and number two of uninsured people. They also have millions of very low income uninsured people. But they won't have access to Medicaid, so millions of people won't have access to coverage. But that's not the worst part. The law doesn't let them even buy into the exchanges. So they are cut out of the exchanges and they're cut out of Medicaid. So we're going to be left with at least half, uh, uh, roughly half, I mean it'll depend, half of the people that were going to be covered under the Affordable Care Act will remain uninsured because of that one decision. And if that doesn't get fixed, and given the politics, what we're living through, something that big probably will be very hard to get fixed. That's probably the, the worst thing, because the political outlook for solving that problem is pretty grim. And unless, and I, don't, I just don't think it's possible, I, I don't even know how it's going to happen. At some point, places like the state of Texas, providers and others will help the state understand that it's literally giving away billions and billions of dollars 
that come from other taxpayers mostly, to Texas to cover those who would be Medicaid eligible for the expansion. And maybe that will, that will do it. We do know that in the state of Kentucky and the state of Ohio, are two states where there was every effort to not you know, have exchanges and, and expand Medicaid. The, the, the forces that understand the craziness of that as a decision at least got two states to turn around. And so maybe within a year or two or three, have a little change in the politics and things like that. But that's the most frustrating last piece. So with that, I'll end, and I thank you very much. I know we have questions. Time for questions. All right. So um, you know, that, I, think, I think we'll see a lot of activity. So just think retail and, um, and hospitality. And the, the, you know, the, the good news is for, again, uh, this law does make possible the millions of people who have low wages in this country, they're not, they're not gonna get paid more. I mean, if anything, what we see, uh, other than you know, the sort of regular, if the economy pulls up, they'll get more. But they're never, if they, you know, if they don't have a high school education, college education, that sort of thing, and they are in certain jobs, those jobs will mostly probably, many of them will go away. And they're gonna, the, the country will automate out everything that it can because of, of labor cost. And you know, we, we've seen many, many jobs go outside the United States. They're gonna go anyway because we're in a global economy. It's not related to the United States. It's most of the companies actually are bigger outside the US than inside the US, IBM for example. So what we're seeing, we're gonna see a shift in the labor force and we're gonna see much more reliance on technology to replace people. Does single payer get into your discussions internally at any time? Um, not really. Um, I, assuming there's not <laughs> Yeah, so uh, the question about um, single payer. First, I think generally most business people are very nervous about anything that's run by the government. Just, you know, they, they don't trust it. Unfortunately, the whole debacle about the exchange hasn't helped, I might add. Um, but there's sort of generally a fear about that, that, that somehow it will become, uh, it will be driven by a government agency and they don't like that. I do, we do have a couple places in the United States, Maryland's one of them, in which we basically have a single payer system. I think they're more comfortable with that kind of system, but I don't see it happening politically. So we don't, we don't spend much time on it. Yeah, hi, Al. <laughs> yeah, how, I'm good. Um, th great talk. Uh, um, and I, I'm curious about healthcare as an industry and the role that it plays in the, the National Business Group on Health. I recently had a chance to spend some time with David Lansky at the Congressional Budget Office and then started learning a little more about the Mid Midwest Business Group on Health. And as I looked through the membership, I was struck how prevalent the participation of major healthcare organizations is in these business groups. And I wondered if you're able to talk anything about the dynamics as a sort of business leader who is a, just a purchaser of healthcare interacts with a business leader who is really a provider of healthcare and on the other side of the market and what that means about sort of the politics of this process as we go through it. Yeah, great question, thank you. So um, the National Business Group on Health is mostly very large employers in the private sector, but increasingly we have members who are, who are earning their living, so to speak, in, from healthcare in one way or another, health industry. But we do not, by our um, bylaws, have anyone in the health industry on our board. And uh, we, we set that long ago because in the early days there was a bigger schism, really. We, we have a lot that are members because they're large employers. I mean, some of the largest employers in the United States are in the health industry in one form or another. And they have some of the biggest problems. I mean, health systems have some of the most complicated employee benefits issues and HR issues on earth. Uh, so we do provide value to them, but no one from a pharmaceutical company or any other health industry can be on our board, including insurance or health plan. 
Now, that, just to give you an example of where that's really important, mostly I don't think it would matter very much. But I do think there are different issues that we take positions on that if they were on our board, they would not let us, because we have a board that operates by essentially consensus. Um, when drug reimportation was a hot topic, you know, we, we, what we try to do is look at it, again, from the employer standpoint and for employees and dependents. Do we think it's good for them? We don't worry about it if the industry that's involved doesn't like it. And so we took the position that drug reimportation was a good idea, as long as it was from safe countries and things like that. But I mean, the idea that we somehow wouldn't want something that came through the UK was just, you know, laughable. Uh, now, I would worry about China's whole different thing, but um, anyway, we said, yes, we want this. And if we, it wouldn't have happened if we hadn't had to be on the board. We also take very strong stands on things like um, requirements that if you contract with a network, a hospital for a network, we say that the hospital should meet certain criteria. And we've even said that we think the exchanges, when they're behaving as exchanges, should be actually using their power as purchases to drive quality, safety, and efficiency. So I don't know, you know, if we had somebody on our board in that industry, they might not be real thrilled to have us be really pushy, but we do take very strong stands in that sense. As a follow-up to David's question, um, our Dean, uh, Dean Polanski, has just left, so he won't hear the answer to my question. Uh, tell me about universities. I pointed out to you that the University of Chicago is the largest employer on the south side, um, employing more than 15,000 people. Have universities become members of, of your business group? Yeah, we just have um, we just have one university right now. The University of California the President's Office is a member. We do have a number of, like we have three church groups, their pension and, and uh, healthcare funds, and we have a number of nonprofits. But we just frank frankly haven't reached out to universities for the most part, although it's an obvious uh, candidate. But historically, I think uh, one, one, of the, one of the problems we find is there are certain industries that for one reason or another are not ready for innovation in health care and health benefits. Point out, point out some of the reasons. One, one clarification is that the University of Chicago is a member of the Midwest Business Group. Is yeah. it? Um, but the, uh, so, but uh, not the national. Yeah, but yeah. we're very different. Very different. I understand. Uh, yeah. Um, but so, the, you know, the reasons are f historically uh, universities have been pretty slow to move on anything. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, taking them good ideas that they're not going to use for 10 years isn't going to help. Um, but I think the other thing is that they are, um, they're dominated by faculty. And faculty like to control everything. So, um, you know, so putting in, I mean, this actually There's just... There's a number in the room. I know, I know. <laughs> but, but, but I'm just being honest. Um, but but we, we had a recent example, Penn State, you may have seen the stories, Penn State tried to put in the kind of programs corporations have been putting in for years. And it was a very benign one. It was like you get $100 off if you didn't do some things, like, you know, take a health assessment, promising confidentiality, I mean, doing everything right, but they just didn't like it. So they, um, you know, Penn State had put it in, and they went to a lot of trouble to try to defend it. UVA, by the way, put in something, too, recently. Um, and within, I would say, maybe 10 days, we, you know, we suddenly hear that Penn State's decided to back down. And it was so benign what they were trying to do. But it was just offensive to the faculty. They just, you know, how dare you ask us these questions and that sort of thing. So that's, that's why I think we don't have many. But universities, uh, universities and um, um, church groups actually have very high use. They're very expensive to cover. And in fact, some of us used to joke, if you, you know, if you, which groups, which were the worst groups in terms of overuse of medical care, especially mental health benefits? And law firms and universities and uh, public employees at the state and local level uh, big users, and they're very expensive. I mean, my guess is that, that most of the public employees have already hit the Cadillac tax. 
So they don't have to pay it till 2018. But when they get there, they're going to be paying 40% on every one of those extra dollars, unless they can talk the president or the next president into changing it. Thank you. Um, my question is uh, about the trend you mentioned towards um, consumers or employees being um, encouraged either by the carrot or stick approach towards healthier lifestyles. I was wondering what's the approach that employers are looking for the future to monitor that? Um, you know, tobacco is one example. You could check off a box saying I'm not smoking anymore. Um, and if it's worth $100 a month, there's going to be a lot of incentive to do that. So. Um well, there's, there's a bit of a controversy now about exactly how to do that, but I can tell you that most employers already have, th there's an attestation. And it's true you can lie on it. You can also lie on your travel expense. But the sentence also says uh, you, you understand that you can be um, I say penal penalized up to and including termination if it's found that you're not telling the truth. Now, something like smoking is actually the easiest one. Um, you know, the bigger problem is some of the other things. But you know, for the most part, most of the things that employers are asking people to do, like talk to a nurse or talk to a coach or talk to a nutritionist about their obesity, is, are things that they should probably be doing anyway. And they're being given the services for free. So they could lie about it, but apparently most people don't. I mean, for one thing, an amazing number do it. Now, they can always quit, and they do that too. I mean, they tend, all these little rewards don't get you very far, frankly. People kind of do the first few things. That's why we've moved to the more penalties, uh, because you know, using loss aversion theory, we're saying um, you're going to have to pay a certain amount. And you're right, people could lie about it. But for the most part, at least so far, they don't. And they do have to, they have to say everything they sign says they could be terminated if it's found out. And you'll know if somebody participated, because you'll have a record. Hi. Um, I just had two questions. The first question, I think a couple of years ago there were a group of Fortune 500 companies who band together and decided not to go, to, um, decided to, I guess, buy directly their healthcare services with hospital system. I think one was the Cleveland Clinic or may, maybe the Mayo. So I didn't know whether or not, is that in combination with their own private insurance exchange, or is that something different? Is there another alternative way of how they're managing their health dollars? And then the second question is, um, there um, a lot of employers are using high deductible plans to manage the cost. Are they going to continue to use that in private exchanges too? Are you going to see more models like that in private exchanges? So, um, well, first, Yes, there will be high deductible health plans in the private exchanges and in the public exchanges. So um, we'll see more of those definitely, and more employers are offering them. In terms of direct contracting, those are all members of the National Business Group on Health who uh, contracted with the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, PepsiCo contracted with Johns Hopkins. The Cleveland Clinic now, as you all know, probably is moving into other jurisdictions. We will see increased direct contracting. And I think we'll mostly see it in areas where there's a large location. So for example, Seattle, and B Boeing does things in Seattle that it doesn't do maybe in other places, although it just joined the Lowe's uh, Home Improvement Company with uh, the Cleveland Clinic. And Walmart, you may have seen the story, just identified six hospitals, health systems in the country that they're doing for knees, hips, and a couple other. Uh, very you know specialized procedures. Uh, w w some of our survey data, which I could share with anybody who's interested, recently suggests that if employers pay for all the cost sharing and the travel expenses to a center of excellence of any kind, that most people will use it. But they w they have to pay all the cost sharing to get them to move, even when they know that the center of excellence actually has much better outcomes. So it's kind of ironic that better quality safety and improved uh, you know, downstream benefits don't get you anything, but money does. Mm -hmm. Right behind you. <laughs> <laughs> yep. 
Uh, as, uh, as you're aware, this is a seminar on um, ethics in healthcare reform. So I was, uh, I was wondering, as you were talking, what you thought might be the single um, most significant um, moral question that an employer faces in providing health care to their employees in the era of the Affordable Care Act? Oh, well, I think probably the most important one is, or the way to pose it is to think about every decision you make as an employer about the extent to which, and ideally you make sure it does, makes it possible for people to get the evidence-based, appropriate medical care that they need in the most cost-effective way. So, for example, um, let's say a center of excellence. So you're helping someone to get the procedure, especially if you're paying the cost sharing, that is going to be better for the employee or the dependent. So setting up those kinds of programs would be good. Ha making decisions based on scientific evidence and ensuring that individual patients, and this is a key difference, have access to what they need as an individual patient, more like precision medicine. I think that that's going to be the big moral question. Because right now, we, we kind of cover everything for everybody. And they get a lot of things they don't need. Some of it's downright harmful. We also, we have new drugs and technology emerging that may be beneficial for a small number of people, but right now wouldn't be, would, because it's, say, not improved, for everybody, it's also not available to the smaller number of people who might benefit. So somehow making certain that what is covered in the plan, what the costs are, another example would be specialty drugs, putting a cap on the out-of-pocket cost of specialty drugs. That, you know, that's the kind of thing. So making certain that all benefit design and delivery issues are made within a moral and ethical framework, and that every attempt is made to ensure that people have access, affordable access, to the care that's appropriate for that individual and that is, you know, medically appropriate. So not necessarily, and this is, by the way, this is a debate I've had with some of my friends who work in the field, if, if the patient wants it but it's not clinically appropriate, uh, should you pay for it, but the patient wants it. And there's some people who say, I mean, if you read some of the literature, they'll say, well, if the pa you know, if patient preference, the patient wants it. But if they, if the, it's not medically appropriate, then I think it shouldn't be paid for. And that's, that's kind of, that's the, the, the point at which we have to think about it. But that's the biggest struggle right now, is between those two. It's easy to make a case for doing more for people, because everybody wants that, seemingly. And they are deluded into thinking that most of what's done to them is actually always beneficial, including mammography or things like that. I mean, so you, know, have, you have these debates. I mean, what's going on right now, as you know, with the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force decisions. And you know, right now, health plans are saying, oh, no, we're going to pay, we're going to pay, don't worry. Um, and in fact, it, that's also in encouraging people to think that it's always medically appropriate. So somehow we have to sort all those things out, but in a way that ensures that precision medicine, individual medical needs and appropriateness are the key factors, not all these other things. Does that answer it? Sort of. Sort of, okay. Okay, good. Yeah, this is sort of a spin on, on Dan's question also. I'm, I'm trying to put myself in the mindset of a, a CFO, not very successfully, I don't think. But are you saying that as I'm considering what kind of decisions to make in the upcoming years, I should consider it unethical to put into place policies that make appropriate care for my employees unaffordable for them? Unaffordable? Unaffordable? That would be unethical? I didn't say, I don't think I said, I said just the opposite. I used the example of capping the specialty drugs. I mean, capping their costs, I said out-of-pocket cost. So I'm not sure I understand. Well, I understood you to say that it would, um, the ethical framework would be to make appropriate care accessible. 
And so it just seems to me that the flip side of that would be there would be unethical to put into place policies under which appropriate care would be unaffordable by my employees. Right. Well, I think mostly if, if you define unaffordable as they have to pay anything, yeah. Right? But th we, ha we have to balance the affordability. So everybody's going to have to pay something if we're in cost sharing, if we're going to afford everybody to have everything they want. So that's just like take the Medicare program as an example, I mean, Part B premium. I mean, is it unethical that they charge for the Part B premium? If, if you think that's unethical, then um, that, I guess I am saying that. But I think it's, it should be small amounts, and particularly all of our members have out-of-pocket cost limits. They have caps. You can't, they can't, they don't have to pay more than a certain amount. Total out of pocket limits. Most of them also now have caps on specialty drug cost sharing. So if you have a drug that's $200,000 a year, you don't pay 20% of $200,000 a year. You may pay 20% of some amount up to $8,000 or $5,000 or something like that. So that's, you know, it's, it all has to be balanced because they, as you can see, even with these, with what we have, what it cost. I mean, we would soon be at the point where we literally do give people more in health benefits than we do in wages if we didn't have some cost sharing. Is there a level at which the cap is so high that we consider it unethical? Um, I don't know that I'd say is that there's a, a level, no. But I would certainly say there should be limits. And it should be based on what it is, too. I mean, you, you get into this with almost anything that has infinite expansiveness. Uh, to give you an example, we had no limits on mental health services when I had health benefits at Xerox. We also had a big group of people in Palo Alto, California. And because we had no limits, if people know Palo Alto, California, we had families who had the all the children in psychotherapy once a week, both parents in psychotherapy. And my all-time favorite was we also paid for a consultation because of the individual psychotherapist had to meet with them. And we paid 100, this was a while ago, we paid $125 an hour. And this, these were for people, now I'm sure they had their issues, but they were not, they was, these were not severe psychiatric disorders. And the question then would be, for example, we had a total amount of money we spent. We actually spent one of the highest uh, any place in the country overall. And we were, you know, the company was getting to be in trouble. So we had to put in limits. And the only, the reason we had to do that was because we had people using those kinds of services at that level where there was no limit. And we had other people that we were saying, no, we can't afford to cover some things. And oh, by whether way, your, your premium's going to go up. They, they paid 10% of the premium because of these. So at what point do you balance that? The question came from the psychiatrist. I knew that. I could tell. <laughs> Marshall. So historically, when legislation of this magnitude is passed, there comes a period afterwards where both parties will work to fix the problems in the legislation. So that's not happening anytime soon. But if that did occur, what are the two or three most important fixes that your organization would want to focus on to, to, to fix the, the, the current form of legislation? Well, I think the most immediate would be the Medicaid, the problem of all the people who are left out and the ones who weren't included because the, you know, the original law at its best was only going to cover about two-thirds of the uninsured at the time, and now it's less than half. So the biggest thing to do would be go back and solve that. Every resident of the United States should have access to affordable health coverage. So that would be sort of step one. But simultaneously, and this is a key difference, would be that they would have to put in ways to control cost. And there's a long list. But they would need to be in there, and they need to be there up front and center, none of this five years down the road stuff, I mean simultaneously. Because if we don't do that, we can't afford it. And that's exactly what's happening. So yes, those are the two big things that we do. Would it take a change in the Supreme Court? Or, or could you do this through legislation? I thought, well, they could do it through legislation. I mean, they, they, they could find another way. They, all they have to do is change the law and say, 
you know, somebody who doesn't have it through Medicaid can get it through the exchange. I mean, that's an easy fix, at least in concept. Last question. I enjoyed your presentation. On the topic of Medicaid and moral imperatives, I'm from Louisville, Kentucky, and uh, a state where two very high-profile Republican senators have been vocal opponents of ACA, but yet we have a, a, a Democratic governor who was highly motivated because he called it a moral imperative, and he said he didn't want to leave all these federal dollars on the table. Given the um, large employers that you represent have a lot of political uh, clout in a governor's office, like perhaps Texas or Florida, um, what, is, what kind of collective political pressure could your, could your uh, members uh, make, uh, t take? Because the tone of your presentation suggested that you don't feel very good about this Medicaid decision, especially in, in, in states like Texas that have six million uninsured. It's terrible, yeah. Well, thank you. Um, well, I think that we can continue to do what we're doing, which is say what we say, and among other things, point out that you know, we need to make the system work, and this leaves a lot of people uncovered. Most large employers, especially these days, are very hesitant to go to something like a governor or a state legislature, or frankly, even the federal government, and lobby on to topics like this because of two things. Number one, they probably already have a lot of really big issues of their own before those different bodies. And second, they know, especially given just coming out of the Great Recession and the financial meltdown, that there is so much antipathy to business. Some of it probably well-deserved, some of it maybe not, not well-deserved, but nonetheless, they're not eager to be out there doing something that's gonna get somebody, you know, saying, well, well, we would need Medicaid if you paid your employees more, things like that. And, and so it's not, it's not likely that they're gonna take this on, and that's actually why organizations like ours as a group can talk about these things and can testify and give information and everything because it's hard for them to do it themselves directly. And they don't mind at all. And, and the other thing we say all the time we take positions and have points of view and work on policies all the time that are, would be helpful to them, but it doesn't necessarily mean that every one of them agrees with everything we do. And that's very important. So, you know, we don't want somebody, for example, we might cite, uh, the, the, let's say take the Medicaid example. Well, maybe somebody has got before the state of Texas an application for something that's crucial to their business. And then for some reason, somebody decides, okay, picks up the phone and says, you know, don't you come up here. This has happened to me, by the way. Don't you come up here talking about this stuff or you're dead. I don't mean dead literally. I don't mean killed. But you mean dead in terms of your ability to influence. So there's an awful lot of really um, kind of meanness sometimes in politics, and it can get pretty ugly. So I think it would be really hard to get them to do it in the way you're suggesting. But certainly, we're working with, for example, some of the big companies in Texas and providing them with information. So if they just happen to be sitting in an advisory group or just happen to be sitting next to uh, a CEO, because they're big shots too, uh, they'll at least know the answer and have an opportunity informally to do something. But formally would be really hard. Please join me in thanking you.